Welcome, everyone, to the Gathering for Gardener auction preview. I'm your host, Bob Hearn. I'm a Gathering for Gardener board member, and uh, I'll be describing what the auction is about, what it's for, how it works, and then we have a number of speakers and a number of videos to highlight uh, specific auction items that are that are really cool. So um, to get started, pull up my cheat sheet here. Um, why why are we having this this auction fundraiser? Well, of course, the coronavirus has hit everyone really hard, and uh, organizations that put on conferences are especially hit because typically, if you're putting on a conference, you have a lot of sunk costs. As you know, we had to defer this spring's Gathering for Gardener conference, and uh, we're a small organization, so we need some help to uh, to get through these times. Um, in addition, there's uh, other uses for the funds we hope to raise. Um, in addition to our Gathering for Gardener website, we have a Society of Mind, or Celebration of Mind website. Many of you have seen our Celebration of Mind talks over the last week. Uh, we're going to be merging the Gathering for Gardener and Celebration of Mind websites and the event system and event resources and make them more searchable and, and so forth. Um, also, those of you who've been to the Gathering for Gardener um, know that there is a gift exchange and often the gift exchanges are papers. And what we would like to do is organize all of the papers that have been exchanged by PDF throughout the history of Gathering for Gardener into a database that is searchable by author, year, and category. Um, long term, we're going to be printing Gathering for Gardener exchange books, um, uh, presentation videos, including the Celebration of Mind videos we just did last week. Those will need some editing and processing. Uh, there's Gathering for Gardener scholarships, so there's a lot of ways that, that your contribution can help. Um, so that's a little bit of the background of, of why. Um, now, as for the the what and, and when, uh, the today is just the auction preview. The auction itself begins on Sunday, November 8th, and will run for a week. Um, it's going to be held on the eBay for Charity site, and the link is on the auction site, which I will... Uh, the Gathering for Gardener auction site most of you hopefully have because that's probably how you got here, but I will share it over the chat right now just to be sure. So that's the master place to go for all the information about the auction. So all of the items that are auctioned on eBay for charity, 100% of the proceeds are going to support the Gathering for Gardener Foundation. Um, so that's the main, the main thing. And the items that are going to be auctioned are puzzles, games, autographed books is a huge part of it. Um, art, sculptures, um, live performances, uh, mentoring, tutoring, uh, and there's some really unique items. I'm going to have, I can see, looking through the database, I'm going to be bidding on some of these myself. The database is not going to be up. Um, you'll have to wait until the auction goes live on um, November 8th, except you'll see a lot of them previewed here today. In addition to the eBay auction, um, there is also we have uh, some partner sites that are going to be donating during this, this auction week, they're gonna be donating 15% of their gross sales to, to Gathering for Gardener. And these include uh, Kadon Enterprises run by Kate Jones. And um, she produces these uh, laser cut acrylic and handcrafted wood uh, polygamino games and puzzles and, and related things. And she's been doing this for um, 41 years actually. So she goes way back to the beginning of Gathering for Gardener and further everybody She's a very familiar face to those of us who go to go to G4G. Um, there's also Puzzle Mist, which is the um, puzzle company run by William Waite, a very talented puzzle designer. Um, again, a part of the Gathering for Gardener community for, for many years and uh, buy puzzles from him and 15% of that will go to G4G. Also one of our speakers today, Roy LeBan is behind Almanac com and uh, he'll be talking about his his uh, puzzlers almanac and um, that and other items bought from his website will also get 15 percent uh, sent to gathering for gardener finally there's a link on the auction site uh, for direct donations to gathering for gardener and of course that is always appreciated um, finally um, we have some giveaways uh, the top three winning eBay bids and three randomly selected um, bidders will receive a special G4G face mask. If I can find that image to share, um, there it is. This is the G image of the G4G face mask. We'll have six of these. And 
So before I move on now to the actual uh, speakers today, showing off their, their, um, their donations, I did wanna highlight a few uh, items that we're gonna have that uh, are not gonna be um, gone over today explicitly. Uh, the first one that was just donated by Diana Conway is a backgammon game that was John Conway's traveling backgammon game. And I, if I can find that screenshot here, I've got too many windows up. This is his, uh, I hope, hope you can see that, correct me if you can't. This is John Conway's traveling backgammon set. He was a backgammon fiend. And um, so this is a really special item. Um, other things we have, uh, so I mentioned autograph books. There's autograph books uh, actually by Martin Gardner would be the premier items. Um, there's plenty autographed by Donald Knuth. He's been generous with his donations. Um, several books written by Gathering for Gardner board members and for their former board members, including Robert Kreese, uh, Colm Mulcahy, Jim Gardner, Martin's son, uh, Mark Sedaticati. Um, this is my book with Eric Domain, Games, Puzzles, and Computation. There's a copy of that uh, by Percy Diaconis and Ron Graham and uh, Stephen Wolfram and many others. These are all you know, rare autographed copies. Um, for those of you who are fans of non-orientable surfaces, we have a genuine Cliff Stoll produced Klein bottle. These are wonderful. And I'm, I'm only sorry that Cliff is not here to present one himself because he's amazing. But uh, these are the best, best Klein bottles, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, Let's see, I see our first speaker was having some computer difficulties, but he's here now. I'm promoting Adam Rubin to be a panelist. And um, Adam, if you are ready to go, then I will hand it over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Bob. I don't know if everybody can see me <laughs> or not, but I'll assume they can. And um, I just want to say I'm really happy to be a part of the, the auction. I really was upset when the gathering got canceled uh, this year. Just it was I think it was the first thing that that got unscheduled in March that I was going to. And then, that, of course, there was a cascading domino effect of all the things the, that had to be rescheduled for a later date. And I, I am excited to see all of you in person again. I was especially bummed because I had something really exciting to share and through the magic of the internet and through this wonderful Zoom auction, I get to share with you now. So if you had ever seen any of my talks at the Gathering for Gardner in the past, you know that my precise area of interest is something I like to call abracadoodads or uh, functional optical illusions, functional magic tricks, sculptural illusions. I, I, don't, I don't have a great way to describe it, so I better just show you, okay? <laughs> um, for those of you that are familiar with the puzzles of Sam Lloyd or even some of uh, Mel Stover's work, you'll be familiar with the concept of uh, concealed distribution, as Martin Gardner called it. I always like to think of it more as geometric redistribution because you have objects that are moving from one place to another and they that changes our perception of how many objects there are, what kind of objects they are, etc. So I've taken this two-dimensional idea of the get off the earth puzzle or the what happened to Mary puzzle and translated it into a three-dimensional object. And if you were at the Gathering for Gardener the last two years, you may have seen my sculptural magic trick, the vanishing and reappearing cigar illusion that I call Quantos Puros. And up until now, I had had to make each of these puzzles, very elaborate, detail-oriented puzzles by hand. Luckily, I was able to, over the course of six years, find a ceramic studio in, in Portland, find a designer in London, and find a uh, packaging company in Chicago to produce a very limited number of these sculptural puzzles, which I'd like to show you now. It is, as I said, it's a very limited edition. There will ev only ever be, in the history of the world, 250 made. As of now, there are 88 extant because of some COVID-related production issues. We, we weren't able to make any more than 88. I don't know that there'll ever be any more than 88, but all of the boxes are signed and numbered. And at auction in this, in this Gathering for Gardner uh, charity auction is number one, signed and, and, and numbered. So here's what it looks like. Okay. 
This is the box for Quantos Puros. Get out of the light. It is a letterpress printed box, custom sealed uh, and numbered as you can see. This is number 42, the meaning of life, the universe and everything as we all know. And uh, inside is this puzzle. So here we go. This uh, is printed less, more or less, if you can see that. There's a nice little graphic there that serves as a bit of a cliff notes of how to operate the puzzle. And we also get a set of instructions that tells you a little bit about the history of the development of the puzzle, some predecessors from Sam Lloyd, Mark Seta Ducati, Gianni Sarcone, and some other uh, innovators in the optical illusion world. And it also reminds you um, how, to how to operate the puzzle and maybe some presentational tips. Inside, we have these custom foam inserts to keep your puzzle nice and safe. And there it is. So let me take it out and show you, take it for a spin as it were. Give you a little bit closer look at the details of those cigars. You can see they're almost photorealistic. All of this is ceramic, hand painted and hand arranged. It's very solid stoneware. And there's some nice little touches like this custom cigar band that goes on to that, that uh, puzzle. So let me see <laughs> the best way to show you this without tipping it over and making sure that everybody can see exactly what's going on. All right, so let's see. Why don't we start here? That's clear. Okay, is that clear? Everybody can see the cigars. Can you see that, Bob? You're the only person I can see. So give me a visual confirmation if you can see <laughs> the puzzle. You see it all right, Bob? Thumbs up? Okay, great. All right, I'll keep going. So. Here you can see seven cigars in this ashtray and there's one empty space. One, two, three, four, five, uh, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, six, sorry, two empty spaces. There should be seven. Um, what happened? Let me, let me uh, give it a spin here and see if I can fix this. Yeah, there we go. Now there's seven cigars, just the one empty space and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cigars. And the strange thing is that all the cigars are the same size and yet I can make one of them disappear. Keep your eye on it. It seems like one should get double the size or be really, really small. But when I give it a spin, one of them disappears. And now there's two empty spaces and just six cigars, all the same size. And what's really surprising is when it goes from six cigars to eight cigars and all of the cigars are exactly the same, same size. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is Quantos Puros. It is a sculptural optical illusion, somewhere between an optical illusion and a magic trick, a very odd item indeed, a very uh, rare, uh, unusual sort of item and only 88 exist in the world. And I'm very excited to offer number one to the Gathering for Gardener auction to benefit uh, an organization that's given me a lot of opportunities and a lot of inspiration over the years. So I couldn't be, couldn't be happier to be a part of this, this uh, effort. Fabulous. That's wonderful, Adam. Very, very nice production and uh, wonderful puzzle in, in and of itself, of course. So um, moving on. Does to, anybody have any questions or should I? Is, should yes, I, I, I should have mentioned uh, probably we'll have time for a few questions and you can use either the chat window or the Q&A window to ask questions. People are talking about how awesome it is. just a little just look at the instructions of how it operates and a little bit of the history of the principle um, mel stover actually created a version um, that was sculptural using some pencils i've seen one made with uh with army men that rotate in a circle but this is an actual functional ashtray it is stoneware it is made by hand and it's totally fireproof. So if you choose to smoke a cigar and use the ashtray for your for your leftovers, that's also that's also um, perfectly acceptable. You won't leave any marks on the on the port on the uh, ceramic. So we have a question: Are the other eighty-seven spoken for? 
<laughs> the other 87 are not spoken for. In fact, there were some really curious individuals that were um, very encouraging. At least, I think it was two years ago, they, they expressed some interest after my presentation at the gathering. I said, I, they said, is it ready yet? And I said, no, it's still, pro I promise someday it will be ready. It's ready. I have your emails. And so if we have talked about it in the past, I will email you as soon as all of the boxes are labeled and ready. I just got some really nice photographs taken yesterday. So um, as soon as those are, are retouched and ready, I will send out an email. If you are specifically interested, um, feel free to email me, ruben.adam at gmail.com. If you Google me, you can find me. I'm the one that writes the picture books and uh, you can find my website and email that way. And uh, yeah, I would love to offer them. They, they won't be, I won't, I'm not gonna put them up on, uh, you know, you won't be seeing Chris Ramsey review them on his YouTube channel or anything. So I wanna make sure that the people that uh, have been encouraging me throughout this long, arduous process are the ones that wind up possessing these, these, um, these objects. Wonderful, thank, thank you again. Moving on, our next speaker is Tiago Hirth, who those of you who joined us for the celebration of Mind Talks this last week probably saw Tiago uh, hosting several of the talks. So thank you very much for that. Uh, are you ready to go, Tiago? Yep, I'm good to go. Um, I just wanted to comment still still on Adam Adams uh, on the cigars. Uh, I hope no one bids on it because I will be bidding on it. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, my I actually will speak about four things that 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 uh, we, um, me and and some other people I work together with uh, submitted to the um, to the auction uh, fundraiser. Um, so personally, I'm submitting time. So if I'm a um, math outreach person for the last decade, uh, I do a lot of uh, science communications in schools and teacher uh, teacher training and workshops around games and mathematical magic. So those are two items on there um, for people who either want wants to, to get some more insight um, into these, be it uh, because you're a magician and would like to know more mathematics, or if you are a teacher and would like to get some, some in, input into, into the performance. Um, and so that will be my main contribution. And then I have two other items, which is from the Ludus Association, a mathematical game kit, which I will show in a moment. And over here, hopefully that didn't break. Uh, and here, uh, a very beautiful deck of cards. It's a symmetry deck of cards. And I think I'll just start showing by, by showing this one. First, it's, it is a mathematical, uh, symmetry deck of the Portuguese pavement and so all of the cards have a very beautiful back background with the wallpaper um, of one one of the main squares in Lisbon um, and as you might know in the plane uh, we have 26 uh, types of symmetry so two, two rosacea um, seven uh, frieze and then uh, 17 wallpapers and so basically this deck is uh, 26, 26, half of the deck is, is without any kind of notation uh, and where you just have a puzzle card like this, where you are um, encouraged to find the symmetry and these are normal playing cards with, with a motif. And then you will have the other half with, with the solution where you'll find, hopefully this is more or less visible, my screen isn't the best, um, my camera is not, 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 not the best, but you will have uh, the, the three types of notations for the symmetries and the place where you find it in Lisbon. So this is both a collector item and if you want to come and visit, it can be your tour guide. Uh, but of course, if you come and visit, do let me know and I will be happy to show you where you find these, these pavements all over. Um, additionally, uh, besides instructions, now I lost the card, you get this, uh, a single card which has a mirror on it. So besides rotations, which you can easily do like this, you can also find reflections fairly easy with the mirror. And hopefully this is somewhat perceptible as a mirror. And so that's that item. And the other item is the games kit, which is a game kit we designed to help uh, with schools. Um, so in Portugal since 2004, the Ludus Association together with other mathematics associations organizes a huge mathematical a board game tournament for schools. And uh, so this has been running 
pretty much every year until 2020. Um, and um, we have over 100,000 students participating every year with the final of 2,000 students. And so we try to give people the materials to work with. And so one of these things is this, this, this kit, uh, which I shall show you, hopefully, probably here. So this is almost an un unboxing video, but here are the, the associations that participate and helped us design this. Um, it's a very simple and very cost efficient uh, kit where you have multiple game boards. So from hexagonal boards to uh, very simple four by three uh, um, boards with a game kit uh, book, which is in Portuguese, but you'll be sure to get, oh, there's one, um, which you'll get also in PDF in English. And actually it's, it's available. And then you have these counters to play with in four colors. So you can play multiple games with that and so that's the kit, kit and and the other two items that uh, that i i propose are my time so either to uh tutor um with mathematics and magic for like i said teachers or magicians who want to know more mathematics or teachers who want to know a little bit more magic um and the other is is a workshop slash uh, seminar slash private class depending on your needs and your interests on mathematical board games, so mostly for for education. And but if you want to get into uh, combinatorial game theory, that can be arranged as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Tiago. That's very generous. I'm going to have to have a deck of those cards myself. I know. Um, somebody asked for the Joker special. I, I, I need to disappoint you. The jokers are, uh, well, they're special because it's a special deck of cards, um, but they, they will just have the, the logo of the deck of cards on it. So, so it's, it's not, not uh, well, it wasn't, the art is, is in all other cards, but not in the jokers. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks again. Our next presenter is uh, another Gathering for Gardner board member, Vicki Kern. Are you ready, Vicki? Yes, I am. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wish I could see you, but hello. Anyway, um, so before retiring in, the, retiring in the spring of 2019, I worked in STEM publishing for 42 years. And my job was multifaceted, but one of the things I did was find people in STEM areas who were writing the best um, monographs, undergraduate and graduate level textbooks, and also recreational books for general readers. Um, that's one of the things I did. Another thing that I did was people would send proposals to me for books that they were writing. And some of the proposals were really good. And some of them were for people I'd never met before. And one person I ended up working with uh, for four books was someone who just sent me a proposal out of the blue. And he's now one of my very best friends who lives real near me now, where I live in Virginia Beach. And some people were very famous and they sent in the most dreadful proposals I'd ever seen in my life. So my offering for um, the auction is to help one of you um, work on a proposal that the editor you send it to will actually put it to the top of their pile. Um, your proposal is one of the most important things that you'll do in addition to writing the book, of course. Um, the other thing I'll help you do is find the publisher that will, your book will be best suited for. So publishers um, tend to specialize in different kinds of books. Some publishers only do textbooks. Some publishers, like the last one I worked at, Princeton University Press, did a variety of books from undergraduate to graduate textbooks. They did recreational textbooks. I mean, recreation textbooks, that seems silly. Uh, recreational books for general readers, some of which are behind me. I hope you can see them. Um, they were the ones I, I really loved doing um, because I got to work with some really, really fun people. Don't get me wrong, people who write monographs are really fun people too. Um, so don't be, don't be shy if you're, if you're writing that kind of book. 
Um, so the two things that um, I'm offering for the auction is to help you find um, the right person to send your proposal to, and also help you write a proposal that will get to the top of the editor's pile. Editors are really busy people. And if you're writing a book, you're a really busy person too. So you don't want to waste your time or their time. And you definitely want someone to pay attention to you. So that's my job um, and my offering for the auction. All right, thank you, Vicki. Again, very generous. Um, any questions for Vicki? Let's see. What a generous gift. Yes. Okay. Um, our next presenter is um, Matt Baker. Are you ready, Matt? Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah? Yep. Okay, great. So, uh, I am both a math professor at Georgia Tech and a devoted magician. And uh, last year I came out with a book uh, of original magic tricks called the Buena Vista Shuffle Club. So here's a picture of the book. And I've donated two copies of this book to um, Gathering for Gardener auction. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit uh, about the book. You'll get it signed, uh, they're both signed by me. Um, first of all, it's a 240 roughly page hardback book. And you can see it's, uh, it's got photographs, it has professional art design, and there's about 25 different tricks in the book. Well, one of the things that's different from a usual magic book is that I've got in between the different tricks, there are dialogue sessions between three magicians fictitious magicians who are friends uh, sessioning with each other, showing each other magic tricks, like we all do at the lobby um, at G4G. And the three magicians sort of deconstruct and analyze all the, uh, the tricks that have just been explained. So the premise is that I've sent a, cop, uh, a draft of my book to them and they're workshopping it and offering criticism and comments and further ideas. So you not only get the tricks, but you get this kind of um, workshop type thinking about how things could be different. What would happen if you tried this? What, what would happen if you changed this ingredient? Um, and they also tell jokes and, uh, you know, it's sort of tried, I tried to write it in an entertaining way. Uh, one of the inspirations for that was actually the writings of Martin Gardner and um, things like Gerda Lescher Bach, uh, where there are dialogues interspersed with the mathematics. So for the mathematicians out there, you'll, you'll sort of like that um, style if you like those books. I guess everyone in here likes Martin Gardner books or you wouldn't be here. Um, but I will say it's a math, uh, it's a magic book. So um, it's not really written for non-magicians. I mean, if you like things like the Diaconus Graham book on mathematical card tricks, you'll like this book, even if you're not a magician, but it is written for magicians. So I'll just say a little bit about the contents. Um, so among the tricks in here, there's a whole section devoted to what's called memorized deck magic, which is where you've memorized a deck of cards and you do various effects with that. Um, there's some incredible things possible with that skill, which all of you, I think, um, being in this group could, could develop if you don't have it already. And um, uh, a lot of those effects are based on mathematics. So one uses the Gilbreth principle, um, which you'll find written, I mean, I think Gardner was one of the very first to popularize that. And it uh, uh, uses the Gilbreth principle together with a memorized deck. There's also non-memorized deck magic. Uh, there's a poker deal that uses the Gilbreth principle so that the spectator deals him or herself a, a royal flush among other things. Um, there are some, there's a version of the 21 card trick, which is one of those classic math uh, based card tricks where you deal into three piles and they tell you which pile it's in. But in mine, it's like no version that you've ever seen before. Um, and it's based on some pretty interesting mental math um, tricks, I guess you could say. Um, so I think there's something in here for uh, all of you, especially those that are into both math and magic, this should really be up your alley. There's also some coin tricks, some mentalism tricks designed for the stage, some mentalism close-up tricks and uh, various other uh, things. So um, that's the book, Buena Vista Shuffle Club. Wonderful. 
Thank you, Matt. Um, any, any questions for Matt? Comments? Looks like a book I'm gonna have to have. Ah, there's a link to the book. Yes, the, someone asked if they're signed and they are signed. Uh, and someone else said, spent the pandemic on Aronson stack, so I'm bidding. Yeah, so <laughs> in fact, um, I use the Aronson stack and there's some, if, when you buy the book, you get access to a website and it has two bonus routines there that are designed specifically for the Aronson stack, if you happen to use that. And also Simon Aronson um, was one of my mentors in magic and he uh, proofread the book for me and uh, offered a lot of advice and helped out with some of the routines. So if you like Simon Aronson's magic, um, you will probably like this. Wonderful. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Roy LeBan. Roy, are you ready? I am ready. So um, I have two things that I'm donating. Um, I'm, I'm not a magician, unfortunately, um, but I'm um, a, um, a puzzle and game creator, uh, more puzzles than games, uh, and also uh, a technology guy, uh, as in software. So uh, two things. Uh, so first, uh, this is, I only have two hands, but there are three pieces. Uh, this is what looks like a very simple puzzle because there's only uh, three pieces. I'll just hold each one up so you can see the different pieces. And the idea is uh, make a symmetric shape. And it's, um, um, you know, there's only three pieces, so how hard can it be? Uh, it turns out this is actually pretty hard. Uh, people get mystified. Uh, but when you solve it, it's very, very satisfying. Uh, so this is the, uh, the normal edition. And I'm actually uh, substituting uh, for the auction something that I, I haven't, um, I just started making these. Um, and this is the giant size. Uh, so to compare, I'll hold up the two similar pieces. Uh, this is the regular size. Let's see here. And this is the giant size. So uh, you'll get a giant size one instead of a regular size one. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's fun. And this is like, you know, really nice for your coffee table or something. Uh, and once you have solved it, uh, you can um, lord your success over your uh, guests who have more trouble than you. Um, okay, so now there's a video for um, item two. Yeah, so I will be sharing this video. Give me just a second to queue it up. And here we go. The Conjurer's Almanac is truly the stuff of legend. Written by the greatest of all conjurers, the great Cudini. It was the ultimate guide to the conjuring arts. Yet sadly, it was lost forever, with all known copies destroyed. Until now. Recently, a copy was discovered in an old magic shop, and a campaign is underway to publish a special facsimile edition for those interested in furthering their pursuit of the conjuring arts. Only the most assiduous and gifted conjurers will be able to master it all and unlock the powers of the universe. <laughs> all of this is true. The great Cudini was a grand master of the conjuring arts, revered by many. Until he turned to the black arts, he has cast a deep and powerful spell on the conjurer's almanac. Anyone who dares read it will be trapped inside the book forever. <laughs> there is a way out. I was the first victim, but I was able to escape. My secret weapon was that I had learned the great Cudini's true name years ago. Even he didn't know that I knew it. That will be your key to defeating his spell. It has been a supreme challenge to reveal this information to you without being detected. I have carefully modified parts of the almanac to place a puzzle in every chapter. They're hidden, so you'll have to find them before you can solve them. After you find and solve the puzzles, you'll have to combine them to learn the great Cudini's true name and the counterspell you'll need to escape this book. Good luck. Okay. Okay, so, so um, uh, here's, uh, so we did a Kickstarter campaign for this book uh, for some limited editions. And then there's a regular edition, which is available on Amazon um, and, and from us directly. 
uh, for 20 bucks. Uh, and if you buy the regular edition from us or anything from us uh, during the, um, the week of the auction, 50% uh, of that will go to Gathering for Gardner. Uh, so here's, here's the limited edition. As you can see, uh, it, it says uh, a, um, a brief history of puzzles. Well, the uh, produce, I don't know why I said puzzles. Uh, so the deal is that you know, you're gonna get trapped inside this book. And once you get out, you don't want your friends accidentally getting trapped inside. So uh, there's a, what's called a decoy dust jacket, um, which you wrap the book in. And uh, this is of course uh, an extra puzzle on the back here. Uh, so if we take off this jacket, you're gonna see uh, this is the uh, limited edition hardcover. Uh, and it's a, a, a vegan leather um, a cover with an embossed um, name. And then if we open it up, uh, start from the beginning, there's uh, some nice end papers, which are of course another puzzle. Um, and then if we turn, uh, just pick a random page, uh, you know, the book is full of different puzzles, uh, color photographs of some things, um, uh, and what's unique about this book in terms of being a puzzle book is you can read it and learn all about conjuring, which unlike these fake musicians who are talking today, conjuring is real magic. So you can learn the secrets of real magic, uh, but um, it is, of course, you're trapped inside. So fortunately, the, the woman who was talking in the video has written a note to you with some tips to get out. And you have to find the puzzles that she has hidden in this book in order to escape. Um, and then when you're all done, you get to put it back on your bookshelf. Um, one thing about the book, and I'm gonna show you some accessories that come with it. Um, it's signed uh, right here. Uh, and if you're having a little trouble seeing the signature, that's because it is in invisible ink. Because um, of course, you wouldn't want your friends to, to see the signatures. Um, so uh, because it was Kickstarter, we added a bunch of things throughout the campaign. Uh, so first item, uh, this is a map to the uh, Conjurer's Warehouse, uh, which is where all this, the precious artifacts that are too magical to be allowed out into the real world uh, are stored. And only true Conjurers uh, know, the, know the warehouse. And of course, you have a map so you can go and get those special items should you need them in the future. This is also a puzzle, of course, independent. Uh, the morgue uh, is another independent set. This is a full set of um, 20 puzzles of different types. Um, and they don't look like puzzles because what it, what it supposedly is, is clippings, newspaper clippings discovered on the great Cudini's uh, desk. And this has puzzles from um, uh, magician David Kwong, um, from Richard Garfield, uh, from Patrick Merrill, who's well known for New York Times crosswords, uh, Brandon Emmett Quigley. Um, and I did the meta puzzle for this, uh, which is the thing that wraps it all up. Uh, two more things. Uh, on Cudini's desk when he vanished, um, uh, there were some of his business cards. So we're sending you one, it's transparent. Uh, yes, this is a puzzle. This is actually two puzzles uh, in one little business card. Uh, and then as a final bonus, uh, this, this is the Librarian's Ruler, which has nothing to do with um, the Conjurer's Almanac, but is useful for the Librarian's Almanac. And it actually, it's a, it's a real ruler, sort of, um, and a magnifying glass, uh, should you need to look at anything close up. Uh, and that's it. Uh, let me see if there's any questions. Uh, vegan leather. Yep. Um, I like leather, but uh, some people, <laughs> you know, uh, that's important. So we, we, we're trying to accommodate everybody. Um, and I guess that's it for questions. Um, so uh, uh, I'm really happy to do this for G4G. It's, it's a great uh, event and a great organization. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Roy. That's, uh, that's an awful lot of a uh, very large number of puzzles. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of bang for your buck. Um, Katie says, is the limited edition the one in the auction? Yes. It's, it's not this exact book because the one you get uh, is uh is wrapped up and and hasn't been read uh this is my copy mm -hmm. and i can i can also plug the triangles puzzle that's a wonderful uh 
symmetry puzzle. Okay, our next um, presenter is Frank Ferris, and we actually have a video. So I will be sharing the screen again. And here we go. Hi, I'm Frank Ferris, and I'm offering this sculpture that I designed. It's woven from three bands, each with a full twist. They're connected in the same way Borromean rings are connected, though Borromean rings don't usually have that twist. I designed it to illustrate the symmetry group that consists of the rigid motions of a regular tetrahedron. It's printed in steel with a golden coating, and the steel gives it a very satisfying weight in the hand. Enjoy. Okay, thank you, Frank, for that wonderful contribution. Frank also, incidentally, is an author of a wonderful book on uh, symmetry and symmetry groups and has produced many, many, he's a regular contributor to the Bridges uh, Math and Art Conference. Okay, our next presenter is Kate Jones, another video, and I will need to um, queue up that video just a sec. Here we go. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I have the wrong video here. Just a sec. Bear with me one minute. Okay, that's the right one. And here we go. Uh, and there's no, by the way, there's no audio on this video, so please read the text.
Okay. Thank you, Kate. Um, that's uh, that's wonderful. Many many of you, like I said, have seen Kate's Kate's puzzles at Gathering for Gardeners. So that's a very generous contribution and uh, and a nice poetic video, as she often does. Um, our next oh, we've got one question in the chat window. Um, yes, Kate Dunn's stuff is very high quality. It absolutely is. Yes. So uh, our next, let me queue up the next video because uh, yes, here we go. Next contributor is George Hart. And most of you know, he produces fabulous uh, geometric artwork. And uh, this, is, this is no exception. So let me queue up this video it is right here. And let's go. I'm George Hart. And this is my contribution to the G4G auction. It's a sculpture that I call Node to the Icosidotecahedron. It's about nine inches in diameter. It's made of uh, wood, laser cut, bolted birch plywood. There are 30 identical pieces. Each piece is shaped something like an S. I'll lift it up here and you'll get a better look at it. Uh, you can see there are these five-way openings. There are some three-way spirals. Uh, everything goes over and under in kind of a, a very intricate weave. To design something like this, I have to think about uh, mathematical ideas from the world of polyhedral stellation theory. Um, like all my art, it involves taking uh, the beauty of mathematics and trying to express it in a, a tangible, physical form uh, that people can see. Uh, it comes with a simple base, just a, a simple wooden stand that you can display it on. Uh, to understand the structure, uh, it's based on what's called the icosidodecahedron. That's an Archimedean polyhedron uh, made of 12 pentagons and 20 equilateral triangles. Uh, when you look at the structure here, the nodes where the pieces join uh, come in groups of five to make the pentagons and groups of three to make the equilateral triangles. There's actually two concentric uh, icosidodecahedra. Uh, inside is a smaller one indicated by the, the other nodes. Uh, so it's not a puzzle for you. It's already assembled and glued. For me, it was a puzzle uh, to design it and put it together. Uh, for you, I hope you simply uh, look at it and enjoy thinking about the beauty of mathematics. Thank you, George. And any of you who have seen his work in person know just how wonderful it is. And often, you know, the puzzle aspect itself is fun. He has had many exchanges of these puzzles that you can put together. So that looks like a fabulous piece to, to put on display somewhere. Um, our next speaker is Robert Fathauer, who I looks like you are ready to go, Robert. I think so. To start? Yep. Okay. I have two items to describe. The first is a ceramic Mobius band uh, with three half twists. I think everyone here probably knows what a Mobius strip is. It has a single half twist. This is a ceramic one. This is a black one. It's, that's not the auction item. Um, it has one side and one edge. If you give a band two half twists, it has two sides and two edges, just like a regular band would. This is another ceramic piece that has two half twists. And then finally, with three half twists, you go back to having a single side and a single edge. And so this is the um, auction item. This is a hand-built ceramic piece. Uh, so this is made by starting with a, a glob of clay and forming it into a sort of torus. And you can't really make something this, this fine and detailed uh, with, with kind of mushy clay. So I make it a rough version and I cover it for a day or so and then I harden a bit. And then do more forming and uh, pinching and cover it again. Over a period of several days, I refine the shape. Um, and it's still quite fragile. I do some sanding at that point. But it's basically dried mud, which of course breaks quite easily. So you have to sand very gently. And you can't do sharp edges like this or they would chip. So what I do at that point is I do a, a low temperature bisque firing. That makes it a lot harder. And you can still sand it, though not as easily. And then I can refine and sharpen these edges. And that's followed by a second firing, traditionally called a glazed firing. This is not a glazed piece. This is just the, uh, the cream color is just the clay itself actually. And that's the final piece. Uh, it looks a bit like plastic on your screen, but it's not plastic. I can try to ring it if you can hear it. Is that too soft? I don't know. So that is the, uh, the ceramic piece that's in the auction. 
The other piece is a set of Dice Lab dice. The Dice Lab is a, a collaboration between Henry Segerman and myself. And there are 14 dice total. Uh, total. Uh, seven are D48s, 48 sided, and seven are 120 sided, and seven different colors. To explain what those are, this is a, a rhombic dodecahedron. This is a wooden one made by Hiroshi Nakagawa. Each face is a rhombus. The diagonals are in the ratio of the square root of two. And uh, this is our, our rhombic D12. This is a, a, a gift at G4, G12, actually. If you imagine the uh, raising a little tent pole in the center of each face, so this rhombus becomes a, a four-sided pyramid with a rhombic base, you then multiply the number of faces times four. That gives you something called a distiacus dodecahedron. And this is the, the shape the D48 is based on, which you can see here. Uh, this is one of the Catalan solids. The Catalans are dual to Archimedean solids. And uh, uh, Bob Bosch did some uh, optimization calculations to determine uh, numberings that are, are balanced for these dice. So if you sum uh, the numbers about any vertex of the same type, you get the same, the same sum. So that's one nice numerical property about these. And the D120, this is the, uh, this is the triacontahedron, rhombic triacontahedron. This is another wooden model. Again, you do the same trick, you make a little a pyramid on each of the uh, rhombic faces. And so four times 30 is 120. That gives you a polyhedron called the Distiacus triacontahedron. And this is the D120 based on that. I talked about this, I think, uh, two meetings ago, four years ago. And again, the numbers are balanced. These are quite, you know, quite hefty dice, as you can see. So the uh, Oxen item has seven of each color, seven of each type and seven different colors. That's the, uh, that was white, of course. This is the uh, translucent amber. And there's a black one. And those are my items. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Very cool dice. And uh, that Mobius strip, wow, that's an amazing amount of work and an amazing finished product. So. Thank you very much, very generous. And uh, I believe we had one comment. Oh yeah, Susan Goldstein, thank you for explaining the ceramic process. Yes. Okay, um, any more questions for Robert? Okay, thank you again. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Mark Burstein, who was going to be one of our featured preventer, presenters at G4G this year before we had to uh, postpone it for next year. So um, Mark, you are on. Good. You can hear me? Yep. All right, great. Um, uh, now for something completely different. Um, Martin, of course, known for... Also, of course, known for the annotated Alice. Um, and um, so I'm actually, I have like four things uh, for the auction. Uh, the first one is uh, simply to join me in Wonderland for an hour or two. Uh, this is um, uh, one third of my collection. Um, this is, uh, there's only two books in this room, uh, Alice and Looking Glass, well, Snark too, uh, basically going from uh, 1866, editions going all the way <clears throat> through 2020, um, from the very large to the very tiny, <clears throat> excuse me, I have about, uh, I think 132 languages here. Um, the Asian languages, the uh, uh, European languages, and um, I keep the Russians down by themselves so they don't interfere in the election. Um, <laughs> so um, lots of uh, tchotchkes and things like that. Um, art. Uh, basically, I, I think what, what I'm offering is um, basically geeking out uh, on Lewis Carroll. Um, I have about 20 books I've uh, written or introduced or contributed to on Lewis Carroll over the years and uh, a magazine. Um, so uh, that could, the, the, uh, this could of course be virtual, we could do it this way, or if any of you would like to come to Northern California sometime, uh, we can do it in person. Uh, hopefully that will be legal one of these days. 
Uh, I'm going to take you upstairs now, showing you a couple of uh, things on the way. It's some blotter paper acid from the 60s. Um, so those are all uh, books by Lewis Carroll. These are all books about Lewis Carroll. Um, everything from biography, bibliography to um, the more academic books, uh, a lot of two-dimensional material, um, very Escher-like looking glass illustration. This is the entire Alice in Wonderland translated into emojis. Um, there, there's just lots of treasures here. My dad started this collection in the mid 70s and uh, it's now about 4,000 books, uh, which I very actively uh, curate to this day. So one of the uh, items I say is um, hanging out with me and talking about Mr. Carroll. Uh, speaking of the annotated Alice, uh, as you I'm sure all aware, Martin wrote this in 1960 and it completely changed the landscape of the Alice books, uh, which were not taken seriously at all until that time um, by academics or anyone else. So he, he showed, by showing us the depths of it, um, he really created a, a monster, if you will. <laughs> Certainly the scholarship has gone on. Um, he passed away, of course, in 2010, and then in 2015, or 2013, actually, I was asked by Jim Gardner to do another edition of the annotated Alice. So with his some of his later notes, uh, I, I added a hundred uh, notes. Uh, also um, a number, uh, I think 100 new pictures, often in color. Um, so that's one item is a very fine edition of this uh, signed by me, whatever that's worth. Um, the other, another one is a bouquet for the gardener which I wrote uh, the year after he passed away. Um, well, I didn't write it, I assembled it. Um, there's a lot of people in here from uh, a great biography, long biography by Michael Patrick Hearn to um, contributions by Doug Hofstetter, uh, Scott Kim, Dave Singmaster, um, Ray Smullyan, people like that. Has some original puzzles in the back. Um, so there would be an autographed copy of that. Um, item number four, um, I am a book editor by profession. This is, these are some of my puppies over the years. Uh, as you can see, or maybe you can't because the screen is so small. Um, they, uh, they go all over the map. Uh, everything from you know, Star Wars to baseball to architecture to fiction. So uh, that is um, mentoring, basically. Uh, if you have a, a manuscript that needs um, pulling out of your head, a little midwifing, or maybe you have a manuscript that's halfway done and needs some attention or all the way done and you'd like to know how to get it published. I'm also, uh, of course, familiar with the publishing world. Um, so it's basically uh, at least an hour, maybe more of my time to, to mentor you and get you started on getting that book into print. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, questions? Fabulous. We do have comments. Everybody is a gog and can totally geek out about Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a little obsessive, but as I often say to my wife, you know, there, there are worse <laughs> habits and hobbies for husbands yeah. to have. Yes. Um, so it's a yeah, multi-generation thing. I hope to pass it along to my daughter someday. <laughs> Do you have all that insured is a question. Yes. Right. <laughs> Don't get me started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. Mark, of course, is world expert on Lewis Carroll and uh, it's very generous contributions that we appreciate. And somebody is going to be lucky. Yes. All right. Okay. Next up, we have um, both a video and a short talk, or live presentation rather, by Tom Noddy. So let me um, share this video to start. What you're seeing 
balls. My father is so happy. That, Tom, is just amazing. So um, are you ready to go live, Tom? Unmute you here. You're, hold on, you're, Tom, you're muted right now. Let me uh, unmute you. Um. So Tom has two videos up and we need to get one of them unmuted. Um, Maybe that's the best way. Can you hear it? 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 No, now they're both unmuted. <laughs> How about now? Oops, still, 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 still. Yeah, I, ideally, the, uh, One, the two, three. unmuted and the laptop would be muted, but. Okay, you're, you're still muted, Tom. Testing one, two, testing me. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Yes. This is perfect. You're good yeah. now. I had it on the tripod and uh, you know, I had to take it off in order to address it. Now I have to reset this. Yep. No problem. Then, uh -huh. okay. Perfect. Good. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So the... Um, I'm a stage performer, which you just saw was a part of my a performance I did in uh, in Germany a few years back. Um, I also play a lot of magic conventions and um, mathematics conferences, uh, physics conferences, uh, physics teachers events. Um, what I'm offering here to this organization is a, a virtual performance. Uh, so somebody bidding would have me at their party at their event virtually. Um, and as at the science centers and, and such, um, or universities, but I will follow the performance, which is about 20, 25 minutes, uh, with a Q and A. And in that, the answer is often uh, more demonstrations or more things I can do with the bubbles besides the act, as I presented it originally. Um, I'm the originator of bubble magic, what I do, and so I have no secrets, and so the questions can be anything, uh, you know, uh, kind of like, uh, like Roy LeBond's uh, Conjurers, what I do is no illusions, it's real magic. I'll just, I'll, I'll say, what's the solution? Where'd you get those shoes? Anything could be answered. Um, so, so, so yeah, there would be a performance uh, and then, uh, and then the questions, let me, let me, let me show you a couple of things that weren't in the video, especially for this group. I'll uh, give you a sense of uh, the, what they like at science museums and such. Is uh, I can do a lot of geometric shapes. You saw the cube in that video. Um, I have to say the general public tends to like uh, the, the cube is just fine. And maybe I can do uh, one or two other shapes. But if I show them a, a dodecahedron and a truncated octahedron, they don't seem to care. <laughs> and so 
I don't do a lot of that in the uh, in the act when it's presented on a stage, but in events like this, I, let me show you. Let me. I'll, I'll go through a couple. So. So here's a tetrahedron, right? Four triangles. And then if I add another bubble to the outside cluster, it's now a triangular prism. Another one, and it becomes a cube. Ain't liquids fun? Now it's a pentagonal prism or what I call a bubble house. I like to point out that uh, People who live in bubble houses shouldn't. That's my advice. Um, and uh, I'll, let me show you the dodecahedron. I call it the bubble jewel. Pythagoras regarded it as the most sacred form in nature. It was a sin within the religion of the Pythagoreans to show this form to someone not initiated into their cult. The religion of the Pythagoreans is what we now call mathematics. <laughs> the phases on the uh on the dodecahedron, very close to being uh, planes. Because the angles required for a regular pentagonal dodecahedron are very close to the angles that bubbles naturally make. The cube, the, the walls bulge out because the angles are. And so, and so like that, I, I'm, I'm happy to show you more or, or answer questions uh, about what it is that, I would, any questions, anything that, that occurs to you. Uh, I'm gonna have trouble trying to read these chat things, so maybe, um, maybe can read Bob, if you like. Thank you. That's, that was uh, fabulous. Thank you, Tom. I'm just amazed. How did you get into bubble magic? That's a good question. Uh, well, I took a job one time in a, in a factory in New Jersey. I was I was a hippie. It was the uh, it was the 70s, uh, the colors were beautiful, you know. And so I took this job and the day after, I wanted to save money and go to Europe. I'd been hitchhiking around America for a while, but I wanted to get myself there and I had no money. So I took this stupid job and the day I took the job, I set the date for quitting. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I worked the job every day, every day for 10 months and saved all my money. And when I came home at night, I didn't want to go out and spend the money. My friends would call us and eh, yeah, I wasn't making that much. So uh, I had to entertain myself. And so I got my first idea was yo yo's. I just, when I was a kid, some kids could take a yo yo and they could loop the loop around the world, rock the crate, they could do all. I wasn't one of those kids. When I was nine and I had a yo yo, I could loop the loop, but you know. Um, so I got a yo yo and I came home, just made it a challenge. And then I just played with it until I got really good and I could do all the tricks. And my father's going, Jesus Christ, you're. You're 21, you got a yo-yo. <laughs> but I got really good with it. And then I got bored because, you know, I was 21 and it was a yo-yo. So, uh, but it was good, it was good. It kept me home, I had this challenge. So I was, what's another kid's toy? Uh, one of those wooden paddles with the elastic and a red ball, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba. 600 was my record. <laughs> my, my father was like, this thing's really stupid. Go back to the yo-yo. <laughs> so, but I got really good and then I got bored. And, okay, what's another? <laughs> I thought of bubbles, but what do you do with bubbles? You make like, what, a, a big one, I guess, and then, and then what, a, a bigger one? Anyway, I couldn't think of it. So, so I just got bubbles and I, I'll do it until I can, and then I just never got bored. At the end of the 10 months, I figured out a number of things that I'd never seen anybody do anything with bubbles before that. And I invented all these tricks and these things, just taking advantage of phenomena that people all tend to notice with soap bubbles. We, we, we were kids and we sort of, we stopped learning at that point. You played with bubbles and then, you know, you spill them, somebody yells at you, that was the whole thing. But now I was obsessed, you know, and really doing it all the time and saw all these other phenomena and gave them names and called them 
you know, tricks and developed an act with them. Went to Europe and I was good at bubbles when I got there. Fabulous. Someone wants to know if the Dodecahedron is on YouTube. Yeah, I think uh, there were, a, I've never posted any, anything at all on YouTube, but there's a, there were a number of videos up there. There was me on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in 1983. That one doesn't have the dodecahedron, uh, but but there have to be some. I, I, there's a, well, I, I'm on I video a couple of times as well. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, I was going to say this uh, this auction preview itself um, we're going to put up on YouTube. So in that sense, uh, the, the dodecahedron will be on YouTube. It's, oh, yeah. You know what? There's a, there's a video out there of the code. It was a British... Um, a BBC uh, a mathematics program, um, a, a mathematician talking about finding math in, in nature. He starts at the uh, um, in Northern Ireland of these geometric uh, structures that stone has formed, and then uses examples the honeycombs and uh, of geometry showing up in nature. And they gave me a big portion in, in the second of five, uh, second of three episodes. Um, and on that one, when I did the dodecahedron, he, he marveled. He was, because it's so regular, I think. It's the one that the mathematicians mostly like. Although truncated octahedron is pretty good. I'm, I, that's nowhere on there. That was the one that Lord Kelvin proposed as the ideal shape for uniform froth. <laughs> and, uh, and people looked for 100 years to see any example of it in, in, in froth. Um, binocular dissecting microscopes. <laughs> And nobody ever found one. So I took it as a challenge and I came up with it. And I showed it at the uh, International Congress of Mathematicians in Berlin in 1998, uh, a big video projection. And I was able to show that form. As it turned out, I didn't know, but I, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not an academic. I'm an entertainer. So I'm doing my act, but I got interested in math because mathematicians are interested in what I do. So... Uh, it turned out it was a couple of years uh, too late. It was no longer the one. Uh, the, the Kelvin cell was just then surpassed by the, the Weyerhaeusian structure, which is now my goal. But <laughs> I, I, all of these things that I, that just finding them, I have the time it takes until the first bubble pops <laughs> to accomplish whatever the goal is. That's one of the limitations. There are others. Wow. We have... Uh... A lot of questions. <laughs> I think we won't be able to get through all the questions, but do um, Mark Burstein asked, do you use the Mobius bubble in your act? I'm not uh, sure you know, that it's, it, and it's not a bubble. It doesn't have air inside, but one could make a Mobius band from a, from a, a soap film. There's a, there's wow. an odd kind of like a, like an H shaped bent wire thing that one could produce and then create a Mobius. But I think unless Mark is correcting me, Mark, I'd love to know where in Northern California you are. When they let us out, I'm in Santa Cruz. I'd love to see what you have there. Um, Count me so in. I, I haven't presented the Mobius, no. Yeah, and one, okay, one more question. Can you teach young people to do this bubble magic themselves? Yeah, a number of things. I wrote a book, it went out of print. It was in the 1980s. Um, I now have a, uh, a kind of lecture notes. I, I, did, I did some at magic conventions and I made uh, a reduced version of the book. Uh, into lecture notes, uh, an updated, better now version than the than the book. Uh, the book intended to address kids. The kids don't really have the skills to to do all of these things that I'm doing, but they can do a number of things. And and anyway, you can't blow an ugly bubble, you know. <laughs> so even when you're trying to do what you saw me do, um, you, whatever you do is going to be nice. It's going to be really nice. You can give it your own name. I tell the kids, but yeah, they can do it. They can do a number of things. And, and I tell them how, if you, if you wet a tabletop and then you blow bubbles through a straw onto that, you can make domes and, and you can do a cube easily. Little kids can do it. Um, so I, I show them ways to get there. The hardest part is really developing the skill at holding a bubble up. You y'all are so bad at bubbles. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why everybody doesn't do this all the time is what I don't know. But right, so it's, it's, kids can definitely do it. And there's, and, and there, you, can, you can ask me, my website is bubblemagic.com and people write me, magicians and children, children doing science uh, projects in school, write to me asking for tips and 
and advice and I can guide them toward some of the science and the how-to. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. That was, that was just amazing. Um, so it would be like a, a 45 minute to one hour performance is what we're talking about uh, bidding wow. on when that time comes. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that would be very cool. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. So um, next speakers I have on my list, I don't actually see attending John and Jane Kostick. If you're here, uh, send me a message and I will uh, promote you to panelists. But for those who have not seen the Kostick's work, uh, it's amazing. Um, the contributions that I have listed here are a wooden puzzle and metal star sculpture. Uh, this, I have both of these. The scar soap shoulder is great. It's this 3D thing that collapses down to a line and has this, uh, I want to say it's triconchohedral symmetry. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. I had pinned Tom Naughty, so um, let me uh, fix that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> here I am. Um, so it's too bad the caustics are not here. Uh, Jane makes these just incredible wooden... Uh, geometric sculptures slash puzzles that are just absolutely precise and they snap together with magnets. Um, so that's gonna be a fabulous auction item. Uh, Nancy says, we still can't see you. Okay, hold on. Um, all right, uh, can you see me now? <laughs> yes, okay, sorry about that people. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry the caustics don't seem to actually be here, but definitely you will want to bid on their items because they are absolutely fabulous. So um, next up, we have uh, Susan Goldstein. Are you ready, Susan? Uh, yes, I think I'm good to go. Great. Um, I don't know if there's anything that I need to do to, uh, well, we will find out. Um, so uh, I have an item, I wanted to explain a little bit of the background behind it. Um, for better or worse, I am a mathematician. Um, and uh, one of the things that Martin Gardner's writings left me with was this fascination with like all the cool little bits of math, especially the things that you can make pretty pictures and diagrams and objects out of. Um, and so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is extensions of the four color theorem, which is something that I think a lot of people who know a little bit about recreational math, interesting corners of math will know about, this is the theorem that says that if you have a conventional map, so like on a piece of paper or on a globe, um, you've got a bunch of different countries marked on the map and you can, if you want to, with only four colors, color the entire map in so that neighboring countries aren't the same color right, which is your goal, because otherwise the colors don't help you see the map. Um, and where this gets really interesting is um, that theorem and its history is already very fascinating, but when you go up to more complicated surfaces, you find that you tend to need more colors. Uh, and so the first place that I got really interested in this was in looking at what happens when you look on the surface of a torus. So um, anything that is topologically equivalent to the frosting on a fully frosted donut um, and this is the part where we'll see if um, this works. No, so I would hopefully like to share a screen. Um, and at the moment, this is set so that I can't do that. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Let me. <laughs> no worries. All right, now you should be able to. Uh... And yes, here we are. Um, so the easiest, quickest way to show you, you know, sort of some of the examples of this and how I got into this is, uh, this is a web page that I have posted and I've had versions of it posted for a while with a bunch of different renditions of what to me is the interesting part of this theorem. So for a map on a torus, um, seven colors are enough, but the surprising part is that seven colors are needed. And the easiest way to show that is to construct a map that has seven colored regions, each of which touch all the others, which by the four color theorem you cannot do unless you've got a surface with at least one handle. So this, I um, actually have a version of this here. I'm not sure how much you can see my video, but this uh, might even be the one that's literally in the photograph there. I have a few versions of this. Um, this is something that I, I copied partly from memory, the design after seeing a handmade ceramic version of this mug design that uh, a couple of mathematicians that I postdoc'd with um, had made. 
Um, and so that sort of started me on my uh, route of making a bunch of these and meeting other people who had made a bunch of these things. So on this page for a while, I've collected different versions of the seven Telerik Taurus that I've made, some of them include instructions that other people have made. This one was actually by a college professor of mine, but I don't know that I remembered that it was there until after I had graduated and got into these. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the work of Sarah Maria Belcastro and Carolyn Yackel, um, both of whom um, have been at the gathering at various times, those are some knit and crocheted versions of this. Um, and this whole thing actually became more important to me eventually because um, it's the way that I got to know Ellie Baker and Sophie Summer. Um, Ellie is Sophie's mother and they were doing bead crochet, which was an art form that I'd never heard of at the time. And when you do it in its natural form, you have these base, uh, bracelets that are tori and they were interested in doing cool patterns on them. And Ellie found my webpage, wanted to see if she could do a seven color Taurus. It's harder than it looks, but eventually Sophie, who was in high school at the time, so that was part of what made it really cool, worked out this was her first design for a seven color tourist map. And then Ellie got in touch with me. Um, and so we did a bunch more work on this. So here are a few more bracelets with different versions. Um, this is a fabric version of the seven color tourist map that Ellie did. Um, uh, this is uh, an origami one by Faye Goldman, which is not related to the auction piece, but there. And then I should be able to keep scrolling down, but I'm behind. There are a bunch of other ones that I need to add to this because lots of people have played this game. Um, but this started this sort of surprise multi-year research project that Ellie, and ba Ellie Baker and I uh, ended up doing, um, for which I will now go back to the video. Um, I'm not sure if my, um, if you can see my, uh, image? Yes. Um, okay. Um, cause, well, I guess it makes sense because I'm me, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing Bob all big, but, um, so this is the book that Ellie and I wrote. Um, and it really just grew out of the interest in that project. So in particular, um, if you look at, uh, this, uh, this is the picture for the chapter header for the section where we were thinking about, uh, maps of things. Um, so, I also became interested in what happens when instead of having one handle or one hole through your surface, you have two. And in that case, the formula for all the map coloring numbers tells you that you can actually have maps that require eight colors. The auction item that I have is a representation of one of these. Um, and actually, Bob, I just saw you switch it, but uh, if I could share oh, again for a moment, um, yeah. this is gonna be a little bit experimental because, um, and if it doesn't work, that's fine. I can just hold it up in the video. But I have, um, I thought that it might be nice if you could see the details a little bit better. Yep. Um, there you go. And so, uh, yeah, I just um, have to close that window because what I actually want to share, um, actually, okay, first I need to make that go away. Um, what I actually want to share is something that I'm not positive I can share now that I look at it. So that may have all been a great big bit of anticlimax. Um, I was hoping to um, show you this with the document camera that I have here, but the problem is uh, so far I haven't used it in Zoom and it doesn't seem easy. So I am, oh wait, here we are, content from second camera. Let's see if that works. Ooh, there we are. Um, yes, so this is the piece. Um, and this is actually an artist study. So uh, I have a piece that I made for one of the Bridges Conference's art exhibits. This is the test version. Um, it's very similar to the final art piece. Uh, there were just you know some small details that I worked out, but this is a piece of bead crochet. As you can see, it's a little bit more complicated than the simple bracelets. This is a two-hold torus. There are eight colors. Um, the four that are concentrated in the upper half, which is sort of the warm color half and the cool color half, has the other four colors. Um, and you have to do a little bit of studying, but if you look at this, you'll see that each of these colors actually touches all of the others. Um, so there was a lot that went into the design of this and the construction. Um, it's inherent in the structure of bead crochet that there's a forced asymmetry. Uh, and so in addition to the eight countries, there's this little ornamental silver bead that's basically leaning into it. 
one of the spirals was gonna be different. So I took advantage of it to have a nice little decorative accent there. Um, and also what I was pointing with that with to give you some sort of frame of reference, um, let's see if I can show it against my hand. Um, this I, I think is not exactly the right size, but this is roughly the size of crochet hook that you work with when you make one of these pieces. Um, so this is not one of a kind exactly, but I guess two of a kind. Um, and I don't expect the other to be available. So this is a relatively unique item um, that I hope will bring joy to whoever it is who acquires it. Um, if you are interested in more details, I have a paper about this uh, in the Bridges Conference Proceedings. Um, and uh, if you like, let me stop the share here um, so that you can see me and whatever else again. Um, I uh, can find it and put the link in the, in the chat. Um, but that's, that's the item. Um, by the way, very wearable as a pendant. Uh, you can either just put a cord directly through it or uh, have a large loop as a bale and then put the cord through that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That is a great contribution. And um, we have comments about how beautiful it is. And Thank what you. else? Are there any actual questions? Yeah, that is that is an absolutely fabulous piece of uh, geometric artwork. Thank you. So thank and you. actually, if you are interested in the background, the easiest thing is find the Bridges Archives with all the papers mm -hmm. and search for my name and Double Taurus. There are two papers that talk about how it was made. Um, oh, the, do you mean my necklace? Uh, there's a question from Roy. Uh, oh yes, um, this is, so this is unrelated, uh, but this is a pattern that's actually in uh, uh, my book with Ellie. That book, by the way, so it explains all the mathematics, but it also tells you how to bead crochet and there are about a hundred patterns in the back of it. And this is one of them. So this is a design that is um, sort of a me a metamorphosis-like. It's um, uh, different tessellations with congruent tiles um, that slowly transform. So it's a, a, a sort of parquet transformation. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, it is something that I've made a few of for me and friends. And if you want to make it, the instructions are actually available and obtainable. Wonderful. OK, thank you again, Susan. So I, I see that uh, Jane Caustic has joined us. Um, Jane, are you ready? Hi there. Yes, we are. Wonderful. Um, and John is here too. Um, I'm going to have John start by presenting um, the star since that's his design. Here, let me move this thing closer, closer to you. Okay. Star is, is a, is a, uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't ready for this. It's a it's a synergetic structure that that is six beams identical uh, identical or equivalent beams symmetrically connecting the points of a icosahedron, opposite points diagonals of it, and it's uh, a foldable thing. It it has this uh, property because the the kind of quasi parallel. That the uh, each beam com is composed of five rods that, that are in a, generally parallel, although there's some twisting and bending going on. But so that's uh, something that that goes back quite a few years by now, and uh, we, we call it a six-axis star. There's a family of them in various symmetries. So now Fo focus in on just. I, I don't, on the center of the star and the way that the 30 beams bypass one another and that leads to this. I don't know how well you could see it. I'll try to just make it go close. Bypass coupling is a, is a phrase I like to use. Yeah, here, why don't I... Um, th this is the same um, configuration of 30 rods, but the rods have been cut short and just... Here, I'm going to take one out. See, if I were to like substitute this little stick that's faceted. Um, it, it's a triangular prism. I don't know how well you could see that. Maybe like that. It's a one, here, I'll just do it big. 
it's like that, 108 degree triangle. So 36, 36, 108. And um, what I did is I put two, a magnet on each of these small faces, and then on the wide face, two magnets. And if you do that 30 times, you end up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just bring it, take it apart. Uh, I can take it apart just simply by, okay. So now it's, um, I have uh, six kinds of woods. I'll pull them out and show you. I don't know how well you could see the color, but um, that's maple, a nice domestic hardwood. That's uh, cherry. Let's grab another one. This one is gonna get real dark later on. It's called Bacote. Right now it looks kind of striped because it's freshly milled, um, but it should get quite dark. Uh, so Bacote, what's up next? I got six of them. Uh, here's, a, here's a nice one I like. It's uh, another domestic one. This is called White Oak. I'm gonna see it as I'm stacking them, you can see, I'm gonna go all the way around because 36 times 10 is 360. Oh, here's a yellow one is nice. That's, uh, they call it Palmarello which translates in Portuguese, uh, yellow stick. Pau is palo or stick, uh, morello or is yellow. So what do we have? One, two, three, four, five. I guess there's one more color in here. What did I miss? Uh, oh, I got some bubinga. That's an African wood, also a really nice wood. So there, you got six of them. I'm just gonna, not paying attention to color, I'm just gonna grab four more. So you see. They bundle together like that. And three such bundles will give you 30 in total. And then to assemble it back, it, it, this is not so much a puzzle unless if you want to think of the coloring patterns is that can be kind of like puzzle like, like there are five of them. Let's see if I can make it the camera pick it up better. Uh, here's like Palmarillo, cherry, oak. I'll go with maple and uh, Bacote. So now I have five meeting at a corner at a vertex um, and th there's five different directions. So if I stick one, one coloring property pro pro problem you can pose is say, well, make, can you make it so that at every corner where five meet, there are five different woods. So one way to do that goes back to that star John's holding where each, okay, I'm gonna go parallel to cherry. I'm gonna put another cherry like that. And then do the same thing, like parallel to the Bacote, put another Bacote. So like that. And I'll do the same thing with uh, the, the maple. Let's see, here's some maple. Um, white oak. I'll grab a piece of white oak. This one, I, I'll complete one-tenth of it uh, to illustrate the idea. I'll stick the, the yellow hearts, another name for Palmarello. So there you go. That, now, now I've got five of the directions represented. And then the sixth one is the one coming straight at you. I think the wood I haven't yet used. What didn't I use? I didn't, I didn't use, um, I didn't use Bubinga. So if I had to grab Bubinga, I'm gonna do one here or here, look from this direction. You know what, you can start seeing the inside of this. If I were to, it's hollow, but if I were to like say stuff it with Play-Doh just to see what the negative space is, it turns out it's a rhombic tricontahedron. So I'm gonna just put all five of the Bubinga pieces. Um, and you can just keep building that way in order to complete the whole thing. Um, and that's one way of making uh, all of the six beams, each beam coming at you, each of the group of five parallels are the same kind of wood. That's one way you can achieve that coloring pattern where at every five fold corner, you got five different kinds of wood. Um, anyway, that, that, the rest, whoever will receive this will put it together. Wonderful. Thank you. As, as an owner of both of those objects, I can, I can vouch that they are both uh, delightful objects. The, uh, there's a fabulous geometry. And those of you who have, are familiar with Stuart Coffin's puzzles might be familiar with that geometry used in his uh, Jupiter and related puzzles where the sticks are glued together. And that makes uh, a very challenging puzzle. So we do have some questions. Um, did you make this on a table saw with a jig? Oh, 
Jane has, you're muted now. I'm sorry, I muted myself on mistake. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I use a table saw. It's not, it, it, table saw is one way to do it. My, the precision aspect of it doesn't really come from table saw work. It can be done that way. But um, the table saw is more critical in making the jigs than it is in making the object. But, but yes, I, I use the table saw, I use a band saw, I use um, a, a joiner and a planer and a drum sander. And then of course, drill press and um, router. There's actually a lot of tools involved in Arbor Press. It's a process is kind of nice. It, it, it would be nice to show it, um, but I don't think I have internet in the wood shop, so I can't really bring this out there. All right. Well, thank you both. Those are uh, generous, beautiful contributions, and uh, whoever gets them, I'm sure will appreciate them. Great, thank you. So um, that is the end of our live presenters. I do have one more video. Um, Nancy says, please take photos of your shop and share them with us. Yeah, I think we would all appreciate that because uh, seeing the finished product, it just looks like magic. Um, so, uh, um, I, I, oops. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that there is a video link I can give to you that shows the process. Well, I think I somehow maybe made myself go away. The video, I don't know. Oh, it's back. Yeah. The, um, I can give you, send you a link. Yes. I don't really know how to do it on Zoom, but I can give you a link to a video. Yeah, if you have it handy, you can paste it into the chat or you can send it to us later and we will. We will share it. I'm happy to paste it in the chat, but I don't really know how. Okay, all right. I'll just send it to us later. But yeah, that would be wonderful. Sure. So um, I mentioned we have a lot of puzzles in the auction, and uh, Nick Baxter has been managing the the puzzle contributions, and he has produced a short video uh, highlighting some of the uh, some of the amazing contributions. So I'll close with that. And uh, just a sec here, Let me find that video. Here we go. Hello, this is Nick Baxter, puzzle collector and member of the Gathering for Gardener Advisory Council. A number of prominent puzzle designers and makers have contributed their works to benefit the Gathering for Gardener. And this is a brief overview of what to expect. First is cage polycubes made by Eric Fuller from Cubic Dissection and designed by John Rausch. There are 47 separate challenges, each to fill the cubic frame with six of the 14 pieces. One such example is shown here, along with the remaining pieces, storage box, and a helpful solving jig. Also included is a 17-page guide with complete instructions and solutions. Earlier this year, this retailed for $150. Next, also made by Eric Fuller, is the Pin Cube Set, designed by William Hugh. Originally sold separately, these puzzles are related, but with slightly different themes. From left to right, they are Pin Prick, Pin Wheel, and Pin Ball, each name giving a mild clue to the theme of the mechanism you must discover in order to disassemble and reassemble the cube. This also was sold earlier this year for $225. Next is Corvi 2020 by Australian designer and craftsman Stephen Chin. This whimsical design was obviously inspired by the more serious coronavirus. Stephen is well known to inject humor into his puzzle designs, and this one is no exception. What you'll discover inside will certainly be as unusual and entertaining as the exterior. Also by Stephen Chin is the Tamago. Stephen put his wood turning skills to work for this tribute to the 100 year old Hakone egg, a simple but elegant design, which he transformed into a clever puzzle box. Now we have the Walnut Yosegi Zaiku braided box, designed and crafted by Kagan Sound. Kagan, one of the best known designers and makers of wooden puzzle boxes anywhere, and his range is incredible from a modest pencil case to a full desk that among other things, requires you to play a hidden pipe organ in order to open a secret compartment. 
Too bad, no such tricks here. But this box is almost as unique, being just one of two that will be made in this style. Those familiar with Kagan's work will notice this is similar to his previous braided box, but now with an added trick. It's likely that a future variation will be produced commercially, but regardless, this will remain quite a unique and exceptional acquisition for a serious collector. Now two puzzles made by Brian Young, known as Mr. Puzzle Australia. First is three wise bolts. There's a lot going on in this relatively small package. The goal is to simply remove the three bolts and discover two secret compartments. Then of course, get it back together again. Along the way, you'll discover some helpful tools, but none of the types of tools that you're used to using. This puzzle retailed previously for $250. And then ages. This looks something like a routine six piece spur, but it is anything but. The ultimate goal is to find a small bit of Australian Lightning Ridge Opal. It's not valuable, but it will be rewarding to discover its secret compartment. Solving starts out like a regular burr, but you'll quickly run into a dead end, forcing you to rethink your approach. Over time, you'll encounter tools, elements of sequential discovery, trick locks, and yes, some engaging elements of traditional burr puzzles. It all adds up to a challenging and ultimately rewarding journey. This puzzle previously retailed for $275. Finally, two puzzles made by Tom Lynch, another uh, longtime participant gathering for Gardner. The first is Pear Dance, designed by Osinori Yamamoto, leading designer of puzzles that look easy, but they're really not. The goal here is simply to get the two pieces paired up in the middle of the cage, but don't be fooled. This innocent looking puzzle is quite a formidable challenge, requiring at least 14 moves to solve properly. This previously sold for $70. And finally, the dissolving rectangle, again by Tom Lynch and designed this time by Go Pit Kayam. This is a so-called missing area puzzle and is obviously a two dimensional analog to the classic melting block puzzle, but with a twist. The goal is to fill the tray with rectangular arrangements of pieces, first without the unit piece, and then a second time with it. Sometimes you'll see this effect presented expertly as magic, but now there's a new twist. Of course, I won't spoil the solution, but leave it to say that the usual technique for solving this type of puzzle will simply not work. That's it for my set of puzzle auction items. I hope you find something of interest. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Am I on again? Okay. Well, that is what we have today for the auction preview. So thank you all for joining us and thank you especially to the presenters who, um, for contributing your, your uh, your auction items, and also for uh, coming on to, to share your stories and, and show them to us. Um, once again, uh, I'm pasting in the link to the G4G auction site, and uh, that's where you'll go to get the link to the actual eBay uh, charity auction when it starts on November 8th. And um, how many people are online? Currently about 50. Um, okay, lots of thanks. Jane, oh, Jane just posted a link to her woodworking demonstration. That's, that's something people will, might want to bookmark. And um, lots of thank yous. And oh, I see there's something in the Q&A. What is in the Q&A? Oh yes, sorry. Um, for those of you who joined us for the Celebration of Mind talks last week, we had a technical glitch uh, last night for the last talk by Yossi Elran. And uh, we're going to reschedule that and we will uh, post the new time on the Celebration of Mind website. So thank you all and um, good luck in the auction. I know there's quite a few things I want to bid on myself. Oh, and we have another link uh, from Jane, great.
Oh, sorry, Jane, you're sharing your, your link to only all panelists. Can you repost to all panelists and attendees? I don't know if I know how. Uh, just there's a little pop up above the chat where you type, just click on it and choose all panelists and attendees. There we go. Yeah. Great. Okay. Ah, and there's the other link. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you once again to all of our presenters. And uh, I'll see you at the auction. Bye-bye.